Wig, 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 wig. I, yeah, I guess we just have to go right into it, huh? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing to say unless you want to come up with banter. Like, what was your weekend like? What'd you have for dinner? <laughs> Welcome to Your Inner Child is an Idiot, the podcast where we look back on things from our childhood and see if they were to begin with. My name is DJ. Hi, I'm Damon. Hello, Damon. It's spooky season. Oh, I am shitting my Ooh. pants in terror. We are doing a new thing where one of us is going to bring the intro, the other person doesn't know. So it's today, it's my turn. I'm bringing a spooky movie. Damon has no idea. Just sitting there, look at his little fucking face. His little stupid face. He has no idea. No, it's just because I'm balding that my face looks so little on my head. No. It's just because there's so much forehead that it just makes my face look little. Now, I don't want to hold this for too long, but imagine, if you will, that you and your cohorts Uh perpetrated something around the time of the solstice last year. Okay. And you think that I'm not- The winter solstice? You think that I'm not cognizant of it. But I am cognizant of it. I think I see where you're going with this. <laughs> We're doing I Know What You Did Last Summer, the movie from 1997. That feels that I'm pretty feels sure that's right. right. Mm-hmm. We got Jay La Hugh. We got <laughs> Fred's Prince June. We got. Do we have a Ryan Phil? Yep. We got a Ryan Felipe. We got. Do we have a buff? Yes. Buffy's in this. And more probably Stuart Pankin. Is Stuart Pank is two Panks in this? No, oh, okay. I have no idea. I can't I can't yeah. back that up. So this is and Vincent Gardini. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly also Steve Martin makes a cameo. Plays a dentist too. Yeah. He's having fun. Yeah, so we're watching I, I know what she did last summer. What do you know about this movie? What do you what do you remember about it? I know that it takes place during the summer i know the kids these oh these horned Mm. up popular symmetrical kids they hit a fisherman and kill him or maybe they didn't but i guess he got their license plate number because (laughs) then he hunts them down with a hook with a hook he's got a hook for a hand he's always wet looking mm. i don't know if he like mists himself before he like appears in their doorways didn't or they whatever. like drown throw away his body or something like put it in oh the, i don't know i don't remember i've never seen this you've never seen it uh, i've definitely seen i it. in fact don't know what they did oh, last summer yeah. at least with any authority i can't speak to what they did last summer it's about a hundred minutes of this guy chasing them and then when he finds them he's like seems like you had a decent time had a couple of parties <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that I knew. <laughs> Wear protection also. <laughs> I also knew that. Wear a Jimmy Cap. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> He's like wearing a slicker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the old timey like Gorton's Fisherman slicker hat that usually, yeah. I mean, we've replaced with hood technology these days. <laughs> yeah. Do we ever see his face? I don't remember. It's been a really long time since I've seen this. I don't know why I would have seen this because this is, it's definitely not going to, I don't think this is going to be super scary. This is going to be on the level of Scream, I feel like. This was in the post Scream. Yeah, this was kind of in the where it's like, oh, people like this again. Crank them out, boys. Yeah. And I know this, I mean, this was definitely a big deal, this movie, but it doesn't seem like one I should have watched because I don't like anything remotely like this. I remember, I think the most I know about this movie is that I'm mostly offended by its sequels title, which is I Still Know What You Did Last Summer, which I would say it's at least like two summers ago, at least by now. Unless it all takes place in the same summer. Maybe they did it again. But then Mm. he couldn't say (laughs) still. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I still know what you did last summer. It just... I know what you did again last (laughs) summer is also a cumbersome title. It's like there's something weirdly stilted and unintimidating about that. I know what you did last summer. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good title. It's a pretty good... I still know. It kind of sets up that, you know, there's some story we're going to learn about the past. There's something happening now that's haunting them. But I still Mm -hmm. know it's just like... Like an old man pointing his finger yeah. at you, like I said. I just want you to know that I know what you, you left did the windows summer. open and Still. the AC was on. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> come on, <laughs> not trying to cool the whole outside. It's Cape Cod or wherever the fuck we are. 
It's already 60 degrees and it's the hottest day of the year. <laughs> Here, put your cable knit sweater on. And a slicker. And a slicker. <laughs> and then that little hat. <laughs> Let's talk about the boys and gals in this, in this movie. How do, you, how do you feel about Felipe and Jay Lahue? Oh, Felipe, I mean, I was too closeted to enjoy him at the time. Okay. But in retrospect, absolutely. He's he's actually almost too beautiful mm. where it actually pains me. It causes me physical yeah. harm to look directly at him. I have to like poke a hole through a piece of cardboard <laughs> in order to do it safely. Yeah. Got to be cautious about that. Yeah, he's a little too... Freddie Prinze I never understood. Really? Yeah. And maybe I'll be proven wrong. Maybe I'll realize like, oh, I get it. Reminds you too but much of But he always was a little a DJ? bit... Yeah. Basically. Maybe that's yeah. it. He was always just a little, I mean, I, we're just talking about people's looks, something they can't control, but also. We're incredibly shallow people. So. Yeah. So I never got that even in retrospect. He's always a little like, I don't know. Not. Goony. Okay. Can I say goony? Goony. Okay. He has a weird smile. Like if he's just looking at you and he's stoic, maybe I could do it, but he smiles and the whole face folds in on itself like the bottom of a clutch bag. (laughs) Oh my God. Okay. All right. He seems like a nice gentleman. Still married to Sarah Michelle Geller, and they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> what did you call her? Ma- Sarah Michelle. Sarah Magellan. <laughs> First to sail around the world and kill a bunch of vampires in the process. These Sarah Michelle Geller and Jennifer Love Hewitt were the definitely some of the heartthrobs on the lady side of the late 90s and can you call is a lady a heartthrob? it doesn't sound right does it that seems weird yeah i feel like it's the least but sexist I mean, your, thing your I heart come is, up with is your heart still throbbing okay we'll let that one go <laughs> the uh, say no more say no more <laughs> i was always a if i had to kind of state my preference it would be a j-lo hue she was my J-Lo Hugh, yeah. My favorite of the time, I think. Or one of my favorites. I mean, Natalie Portman was my favorite of the time. But, but she's, she's not in the she, she wasn't so, on the, I mean, I don't know why you even... Not choice. Why she's even in the running, why you <laughs> put her at the top of your fuck, Mary kill for this movie. It seems weird. <laughs> yeah, J-Lo Hugh, J-La Hugh, my apologies. Is she a party of five? Is she one of the five? Sound... Or no, that's Lacey Shim... I gotta be honest, Boo. I've never seen that. I have no idea. You a big fan of J-La Hugh's music career that came <gasps> shortly after this? And I'm got something breaking. Until you just said that, I cannot believe it. It was a perfect song for those VH1 retrospective shows because if someone got naked in the year 1987, they got to play J. La Hughes Bare Naked. Perfect for mm. them. Do you think she was finally capitalizing on the success of Bare Naked Ladies? <laughs> yeah, she's like, I like the way you think, Canadians. <laughs> Are you a big Ghost Whisperer fan? Have you just kept up with her career ever since, or what? I don't know what that is. It's a show. Where she whispers to ghosts. I don't know if she can actually whisper to ghosts, or if that's somewhat metaphorical. Or she's like, has a bunch of trained ghosts, like... <laughs> All right. Like Caesar Milan. Yeah. <laughs> just like misting them with the goo from <laughs> Ghostbusters 2. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a much better show. I think it was on a basic cable, too. I don't even think it was network. Yeah, wasn't that on, it was like, something like Ion. Ion? Yeah. Whatever happened to Ion? But it was a hit. Ion it becomes... ran for like 17 seasons or something. Oh, my God. PAX became Ion. And then Ion, I think, is now like true TV. Okay. All right. It's all a rich tapestry. It is. Well, we're going to watch I Know What You Did Last Summer. And mm. then we will know what And then we'll find out what, in fact, they did. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'll kill a guy. <laughs> or I thought they killed sure a guy. Pretty sure the Gordon's fisherman doesn't make mm-hmm. it out. Watch along with us. We'll be back after this. Let me ask you a question, Damon. You know how the kids in this movie... Spoiler for anybody who hasn't watched this movie. You know how they, like, murder a guy, and then they're in, like, a secret club because... They're the only ones that know this thing happened. A secret that only they share, of course. It's not a particularly fun club, but don't you kind of, like, doesn't part of you just kind of want to be in a club like that? You know what I mean? I just want to have a secret with someone. That's all I want. It's like, it doesn't have to be murdering a transient. I just want to have a secret that we just share. Like, I just want to be part of the in-group. 
I have a secret to let you in on that very few people Tell know more. about. <laughs> and it's called our Patreon <laughs> Club. Startlingly few. Uh-huh. It's called our Patreon. Patreon.com slash your inner child is an idiot. That is a terrible lead-in to a wonderful thing. You can get extra episodes. Mm -hmm. You can get bonuses. You'll get your name written in the credits. You'll get your name written in the written credits. You'll get, if you subscribe at the top level, you can get your request shot to the top of the request list of movies and TV shows. And DJ, don't gloss over some of the best features of the top tier, which is some of your high school enemies will be murdered in a lobster shack for you. Yeah. We will... Pretty sweet deal, huh? <laughs> that is a pretty sweet deal. We you can make movie requests and your high school enemies will be slaughtered. Anybody you want eliminated, I will have my drunk friend lend me his <laughs> car. <laughs> Wait, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, hold on. Mm-hmm. I don't want to commit to that because then technically I'm a hitman. Don't put it on tape. This is something yeah. we should just put on the Patreon website because no one will find that. Patreon.com slash your an idiot. That's where you can find <laughs> this confession. <laughs> Damon, we are back. We watched. <laughs> Thank I know, you. I know what you did last summer. Uh huh. Yes, we did. You pointed out how grammatically correct that is because a lot of the action does take place this summer. The summer of. That's right. I don't want you to get yeah. confused. Yeah. It's sort of like a Rashomon type deal where you're you're mm-hmm. sort of bouncing between two storylines, and by bouncing I mean you start in one and end <laughs> not, for the majority of the film. Not another. bouncing. Really There's no at bounce all. at all. Yeah. It's kind of like the way I play tennis, where you know some people like to bounce the ball back and forth. I like to have the ball bounce in my court. I swing at it, I miss it, and it just <laughs> hits the wall behind me. You bounce it to me. That's my thing. I bounce it. It hits the net. I get really fucking pissed, and then <laughs> that's the movie. And then you're like, it's just a game. We're not completing for the Olympics, Deej. Just calm down. We're just hanging out and wearing shorts and sweaters. <laughs> I'm going to recap this. I got this. I got this one. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Great. Go for so, it. So there's some teens hanging out. Helen, Barry, mm-hmm. Ray, and Julie. Just normal ne- late 90s teen Helen? Na- teen names. Helen. Helen Sugar. I'm sorry. Is Sarah Michelle Geller's name Helen? Helen. So this might surprise you, but the book that this is based on was written in the 70s. (laughs) So I didn't even know this is fucking based on a book. I didn't do any uh, research at all. This is your one. No, I picked this one, didn't I? I Yes, I did Little Shop, like a a Christian American. You picked the the better movie. (laughs) (laughs) They're waiting for the end to see our our verdict. Not to spoil the fact that I know what you did last summer is worse than Little Shop of Horrors (laughs) to us. Two 41-year-old men. Okay, so these teens, which once again are named Helen, Barry, Ray, and Julie, are they're celebrating mm-hmm. a school and Helen's pageant win, and they go out and they're having a good time, like you do on the beach with teens that live in mm-hmm. North Carolina. And You fuck in front of your friends. Didn't we all do that in high school, that you took, took each other out to the beach and then separately fucked within eyesight of each other, within earshot of each other on the beach? within other shots of each other. So Jennifer Love Hewitt's character loses her virginity on a beach. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot we were still in the recap. Go ahead. Not even the beginning of the recap. So (laughs) I can't remember which one's Barry and which one's Barry is Ryan Phillippe. Okay. Barry and Ray is Ryan Prince. That's not a person. Freddie Prince. Barry's too drunk to drive. And so Ray drives his car and they're on their way home. Barry is, because he's drunk, he does what all drunk people have always done in every ride home. That Any car that has a sunroof, they get up and they slosh their beer around. He spills some beer, distracts Ray, who then accidentally hits someone on the road. They find mm-hmm. the body of this man. And then instead of calling the police, they decide to dump his body into the water. And when they do, it actually turns out he was alive. So they did a murder. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so... They tried to hide a body and uh, attempted murder, yeah. Yeah. And then they move on with their lives. Things aren't going well, but they've moved on. They have not been arrested, so... Interesting view. Okay. (laughs) Well, I'm just saying. They haven't been arrested, so (laughs) fucking they've moved on. And a year later, Julie gets a letter when she comes back home to visit, and that letter says the title of the movie, I Know What You Did Last Summer. And she's, of course, horrified. Mm -hmm. Who's sending this? What's going on? It turns out they didn't actually kill this guy. And he decides to try to torture them and kill other people 
and them also. I was a little fussy on his on his scheme, but yeah. Yeah, and eventually through a like kind of a well, okay, so let's see. I'm trying to keep this short and it's not working. So I think that ship has sailed, my friend. <laughs> a friend of theirs is killed. Helen's sister, Veronica Vaughn from Billy Madison is killed. Eventually yeah. Barry is killed. Then Helen is killed. But Ray and Julia are left. They have a swashbuckling fight with this man on his ship. There's riggings. There's jibs involved. He gets Mizzen smacked masks. in the face and then eventually jibbed up and his hand gets jibbed off and then he drowns, yeah. we presume. And then we fast uh, forward to- like a true Navy man. His hand gets jibbed off. <laughs> he oh, you gets, jibbed the hell out of him. He gets square knotted into a <laughs> mizzen mast. His swash was all buckled in the end. I couldn't even look at him. And then he presumably drowns. But then right before, or right, what is this, like a year later? Do we know how much longer later this is? It's always a year, yeah. His Julie, thing is July 4th. Michael Myers has Halloween, so he had to take July 4th. Okay. Julie is taking a shower in her dorm, like very fancy dorm. A very nice dorm shower where the faucets go up to 211 degrees from what I could gather. It was so fucking steamy <laughs> she gets, in there. She gets the whole bathroom steamy like a dickhead. And then she like, sees- Like, you making pasta in this room? <laughs> she sees written in steam. I, I still, still know. know. And then at the very last second, he bursts he through the glass. Busts out of the mirror? And then, I don't think it's a mirror. It's like a shower door. But then, credits. Oh, so, okay. And that was the end of it. We are left. It's left to the imagination. There were no more, more movies after this. I don't think so, buddy. That was a terrible recap. I'm sorry. That is on par with some of my uh, recaps. That was terrible. I feel like I'm doing like a post-game press conference. Like, uh, yeah, you know, we had him in the first quarter and then uh, things started to fall apart. Damon's phone went off. I'm not saying it's his fault, but I'm saying it kind of <laughs> distracted me. But really ruined my focus of the team. Yeah. We really need to focus in. If Deion Sanders could turn off his phone, I just really want to stress that. I know he doesn't play anymore. He's more of a coach in the coach capacity, but still the phone is distracting. You can hear it further than you'd think, especially when it's Mariah Carey's butterfly going off on the reg <laughs> during the game. This door came open while we're talking about a horror movie. That is terrifying. I'm going to go check oh, on it. Oh, that's no good. Oh, no, I don't like that because he might cut all your hair off, your beautiful hair that you're always combing. I checked the door, but then I got pulled out of the door. Oh, my God, of course. Can you react like you're horrified? <laughs> but now you want me to react? I just, I just wanted to go. I guess we have established there is delay in the recording, so it, that would work. Like a nine minute delay. <gasps> oh, Deej! Let's go through this movie. First of all, didn't we just? Do I want to talk about the yeah. incredible butt rock version of "Summer Breeze" that the song opens with. I didn't even, until I listened to it the second time, I didn't realize that it was a cover of that Summer song. Breeze. I, it was so, Summer breeze, make me feel. And it was like offbeat, like the, the lyrics didn't, the lines weren't together. So it was, it was, I feel like it was an audio illusion. I was, the second time I heard it, I was like, wait, I know the, these collections of words, but not necessarily to this slow beat. <laughs> Into the jasmine There's no like cool rock way to say jasmine. That's true. <laughs> it's like soup. It's like soup. <laughs> I'll have soup and I guess like a jasmine tea. Sorry, I meant jasmine tea. To be fair, there's not like a lot of food items that are you don't have to kind of say mincingly, honestly, if you're ordering. What about ribs? Ribs. I don't know, ribs. Is it the S? Yeah. If I order one rib with that, with one rib, please. I, I imagine anybody ordering food is just kind of like, it's like eating a lollipop. There's not really a strong way to do it. You're like, yeah, I want the classic, you know, Donald, Donald Trump is ordering like, give me a well done steak with ketchup. It's like, does that make like you, a five? Does that make you feel tough? Because that makes me feel like, yeah, you're a child. Just don't order the steak. We're just there are other meats. It's fine if you like that, I guess. But how do you like? It? <laughs> how is that possible? I want it gray all the way through. <laughs> uh, so you're saying there's not a mincing? Surely eating a well done steak is not mincing. 
I mean, right? I mean you can it's childish. You're not gonna get through it mincing. True. You're gonna need you're gonna need to mince it. You're gonna have to pull it apart with your teeth like a saber toothed tiger. Johnny Galecki has a person that I've been told I look like from time to time. Ooh. How do you feel okay. about that? I don't buy that. I have glasses, and sometimes he wears glasses. Not in this movie. When he's big banging, yeah, he, he wears glasses. Yeah. I don't have like curly hair. I, I feel like other yeah. than being having dark hair and wearing glasses, there's not much. No, take off your glasses real quick. <sighs> We're going to have the tiny eyes thing happen again. Oh, yeah. Millhouse syndrome. No, you don't look remotely like him. I can't, I can't think of any Johnny Galecki lines. Who's the daughter <laughs> from Roseanne? Becky. <laughs> no, the other one. The one he's dates. <laughs> No, that's Becky. No, Becky's the older sister. Oh, Sarah Gilbert. Yeah. Darlene. Darlene. Darlene, I love you. Is that Galecki? Uh, that's Darlene. Uh, I'm a lesbian. So Galecki played I'm a, lesbian in real life. a friend who's pining after J-Lo Hugh. And yeah. so I don't think he's necessarily supposed to be like super innocent, but he's like a real creepazoid. He's only in three scenes, but it felt like every three scenes his character every scene his character changed like in the first yeah. scene he was like sort of this mousy nerd because yeah. he he brought j-lo hugh a, a shot and then in the second scene where he drives by the car accident in the titular last summer of knowing he acts like a like a real prick yeah i couldn't figure out what his deal was well he gets kind of pissed off in the first scene because Barry like shoves him or punches him. I can't remember. He like Shove, shoves, just him. shoves him and like gets the pushes him away. And so I took it. At, oh, he's the what I screamed aloud while we were watching was that he was the mousy nerd, but also that he did it. I was like, he's the one he did it. He's the one who knows the last summer antics. I don't know. And then in the second scene, he's more of a like a he almost comes off as a rich prick from an 80s movie. Because he calls, but I think he's Freddie actually Prince. supposed to be a working class prick who's making fun of Freddie Prinze for trying to act rich, act up. I guess, but it, it didn't come across very well. I mean, one of my main problems <clears throat> with this movie is that these characters aren't very well established before they go through this traumatic event yeah. that sort of colors the rest of the movie, and then I'm supposed to see how different they are now. Yeah, but I really don't get to know them beforehand. Aside from like really half-assed movie characterizations of J. Lo Hugh talking about phallic symbols and calling the two guys who are being sexist sexist, so I'm supposed to think she's like a shrewish Old brainiac over here. But she's dating one of the and guys. Then, like it's not like she's that. Yeah, mad you're about dating it. one of these sexist pricks you're talking about. Ryan Phillippe probably gets the most characterization, but that's mostly because he gets to be an absolute asshole. And he's a total stereotype, too, where you can kind of fill in the rest without the movie having right. to do a lot of work. And I think they're trying to do that with J-Lo Hugh as well, where she is, oh, yeah, she's the smart one. Yeah. Because she's brunette, following the rules of early Taylor Swift songs. I have to say, oh, she's a bitch and a smart brunette. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that voice. Is that Taylor Swift's <laughs> voice in my brain? Yeah. She wears and short then shorts. And the other two. Yeah. <laughs> He's wearing t-shirts or some I shit. I got a blank space, baby. I'll write your name. <laughs> I'll write your name. That sounds like if I have an interaction with a clerk and I'm like, I can almost guarantee you're not writing down my name. Please write down my name while I'm still here at the counter. Now nah, I'll write down your name. <laughs> Just go back to your table. Don't worry about it. Your drinks are on the way. I'm right. And he said, marry me, Juliet, (laughs) et cetera, et cetera. I don't know the rest of the words. Anyway, the song writes itself. Marsha Blackburn's a bitch. I don't know if you know this. This total side note that has nothing to do with this movie. But the big news is, you know, Taylor Swift is dating Travis Kelsey, who's a a football player who plays for the Kansas City. Footballman, yeah. And so my favorite thing, it's old now. I'm over it. But and it's definitely going to be old when this episode yeah, releases. And not even just in terms of news, but just in terms of it was funny and now I'm over it. The commentators just really had a field day putting Taylor Swift's lyrics, like fitting them in. And that was very clever for about one day. And then it went on for. Right. Well, days. they spent all the day before researching Taylor Swift <laughs> songs. So come on. <laughs> I agree with that. And so Sarah Michelle Geller is supposed to be Helen. She's supposed to be like the bombshell. I can't he not hear it in Chevy Chase screaming Helen's voice in the National Lampoon's movie. I, Helen! I think of Tommy Boy. Helen, you look like a Helen. <laughs> she does not look like a Helen. Tommy Boy is my favorite movie. That's true. I have to say it at the end of every episode. 
Yeah, and I, I wanted to fill in the blanks with her as well and that, oh, okay, so she's a beauty queen, so she's going to be a bitch. But she's fine, I yeah, guess. Her sister. She's got a dream to, she might be a little bit shallow. Her sister is off the chain. Yeah. I don't know if there's supposed to, if there's more, like if that's fleshed out in this book you keep telling me about. <laughs> they made one reference to. <laughs> Get off but my like, fucking back with the book shit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I got too much on my plate to be reading every book that comes along. I feel like the movie was like, yeah, you know, siblings, you know how they're horrifically cruel to each other. Bridget Wilson, who played Veronica Vaughn and Billy Madison is the older sister. And at, thir- at first I thought she was her mom. Not because, right. I mean, she looks. They do seem oddly. Yeah. She looks older, and I would guess she look. If you had me guess, I would have said she's like do. ten years older than her. Mm-hmm. But that's why I thought she was just a really young mom, or maybe a stepmom. And it's not really established until later when you're like, because she says the older sister. I can't remember her character name. She says Elsa, Elsa, that- Elsa, and Helen. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I feel like it's in the same vein of age names. Okay, let's just look it up real quick. Don't say age names. That's not a... No one says age, age names. Yeah, that's... No, that's a normal thing. Age names. Elsa, you're absolutely right. Elsa. Elsa! Yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't know why I got so so invested in it. <laughs> now it sounds like you're covering my tracks, but I was more mad at the, at the, <laughs> the movie than you. Elsa won't let... She, like, doesn't let her in right away when she's running... When Helen's running away from the murderer. And very clearly, yeah. I feel like... Unless you actively want to kill your sibling, there's no way that your sibling coming up to the window and clearly and screaming. screaming, very upset, you wouldn't just kind of hurry at least. She does kind of like forget her keys. And I don't know, I guess it's established that she thinks that Helen is like dramatic and she's a beauty queen and all this stuff. But I'm like, we don't really see. Yeah, we never any of that. see that. We just hear her say that in one scene, in that party scene where they're celebrating her win at, at this big like party at which we meet no one except for our four leads and Max. Yeah. yeah. I thought Elsa was like, it was really overplaying. I was like, are you trying to tell me that this is sibling rivalry? Cause this seems like sociopathic hatred yeah. of each other. Really. It's just one sided. Like Elsa just really hates Helen and it's never explained. And I feel like maybe they're trying to, this movie is very much trying to fit into the scream mold of like being a mystery on top of being a slasher movie. I don't think it's very effective in that they keep killing suspects at a pretty good clip (laughs) where I'm like, well, I guess it's not Max since he just had his jaw separated by a fish hook and it's not Elsa because she gets killed the minute she steps forefront into the story. So it, you really just, and the mystery that actually gets solved is ludicrous. We'll get to that. Not to get too far af- afield. It, yeah, Elsa is deranged in her hatred of her sister. It is kind of established that they're dysfunctional in some way because there's obviously something between those two. But then she says like, hey, dad, to her dad, who's just like watching TV, who just like completely ignores her. It was yeah, like, what's and going he's drinking on? a scotch or what's something. What's going on here? But we don't really hear much more. Elsa runs her, the father's store now, I think. Mm. It's implied, I don't know if he's retired or she's just like second in command or something. But then you also have to keep reminding yourself, and it doesn't help that their names are as they are, as we've already discussed, but she's 18. There's no reason to be angry at her for not running a store with you. It's a little ludicrous to like force that on, on she's like a still teenage in school. girl who just graduated yeah. high school. So we have Julie, the staunch feminist. Yes. And then we have She's Helen. She's so mousy who, and unattractive. Oh, yeah. uggo. Yeah. Total uggo in this comely lass that is J-Lo Hugh. It is, it is deranged that she, even in the first scene before they have this traumatic event, you can see that Jennifer Love Hewitt is already like, not jealous per se, but you know, she sort of is wistful of, of how beautiful Helen is. Mm. And then- then they try to uggo up J. Lo Hugh after the events. And when we see her in the current summer, when she goes to college and she's flunking out and looking very pale, her roommate is making fun of how pale she is. She just looks like she has the flu, but still a flu I would kill to have. <laughs> 
Yeah, the- she looks great. It's deranged that this movie keeps shitting upon uh, how bad she looks. It doesn't say it in dialogue, but I mean, I feel like yeah. they keep trying to make her ugly. And I'm like, I don't think you can do that to Jennifer Love Hewitt. Well, and it's it's supposed to be like this. It's not that sharp of a contrast, but she dresses more conservatively and all this kind of stuff. But it's her hair is kind of greasy, but we don't want to make it too greasy because we still want, you know, straight boys to come see the right. movie. So did her roommate drive her? From Boston to North Carolina and then drop her off. Again, the movie's not interested in explaining that. Is her roommate Deb? Is that Deb? Is it Deb? Well, I remember in the end scene, she's like, someone behind the shower screen, she's like, thanks, Deb. But I didn't know if that was supposed to be the same girl. Mm. It's not important. It won't come up again. It is Deb. Deb. Yes. That's she that's is very angry because Jennifer Love Hewitt wants to stay in Boston because she doesn't want to go back to her hometown. We later find out she has not been back to North Carolinaville since the events of since she left since the titular season. So, are you a Ryan Philippe guy or a Freddie Prince Jr. guy? Just me and Tyler person. had a, an all out brawl about this. Mm. I am a Ryan Philippe guy. All the way. Okay. Freddie Prince Jr. to me looks like a sex doll who has come to life and is still learning the human emotion of love. Like every time he he is looking at anything, he looks like he's seeing it for the <laughs> first time. I'm like, that's Jennifer Love Hewitt. That's your girlfriend. You don't have to look at her like you've never seen her before. Like when- <laughs> and he's got those black eyes, like like a doll's eyes. Like he does. It doesn't seem like anything's getting in there. He seems like a very nice guy. And we actually looked him up on Google image search. And I would probably fuck Freddie Prinze now more than Freddie Prinze then. There's something off put. He like, he's, he's too stupid looking to that. I'd be like, no, this is wrong. There's something unethical about this. We can't, we can't continue. We've got like a young Keanu vibe in this movie where he's like, what? Also um, when he, he makes Keanu look like fucking J Robert Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> he, like he does not look, he does not look bright when they come back this summer. Freddie Prince Jr. is working on a fishing boat. and Just like his father did, as far as he He knew. comes off the fishing boat, and he's wearing a black A-shirt, and he's got his That's hair what we're now, correct. S- spiked up. He looks like he's auditioning for 98 Degrees. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is happening? And that is definitely the boy band that Freddie Prince Jr. would get in. Yeah. Like, he wouldn't be in a top-tier boy band. Yeah. He'd be in five or 98 Degrees, that's it. That's the the glass ceiling he'd be hitting. <laughs> I was always a J Lo Hugh guy. I mean, Sarah Michelle Gellar is she's an old crone. What are you talking Sarah about? Sarah Michelle Gellar is a beautiful woman, but like it's it, yeah, she's clearly the the star in this, and they in that she survives, and that she survives. Well, that's one thing. I like my women alive. <laughs> <laughs> Call me old fashioned. <laughs> Do you think? Let's not gloss yeah. over Ryan Felipe. Okay, though. yeah, he's got the pouty. Who lips. is mean? He's got the pouty lips. I will say I was surprised That's my by Ryan Felipe. If you had asked me to like imagine Ryan Felipe before this movie yeah. and then imagine him after seeing it, I'm like, these guys are a lot scrawnier than I remember. They're like string beans. I always get twinks as we call. I them. always get Ryan Felipe confused with Hayden Christensen. Oh no. Come on. Come on. They're like Ryan Felipe is so pretty. To me, he's so pretty that I get angry. Like I'm upset. <laughs> It feels like wealth hoarding in beauty. Like, come on. Some of us don't have anything. Can you just give us a little bit? It's kind of a masterclass of late 90s bad teen acting, too. And <laughs> what I like, though, that I, I do feel like Ryan Philippe comes out like the best because he gets to play like an archetype. You know what I mean? He gets to yeah. kind of like be the douchey bully. I don't think that means that everyone could do it. So good job, Ryan. But I think it's like a little bit. He has more to do than anybody else. Yes, I would agree that he he comes off the best. Both our leads, Freddie Prinze and J Lo Hugh, are supposed to be kind of like the most nuanced and most sympathetic, and that's a lot for both of them to handle. That is a very generous way of saying. That. Yeah. Yes, I think that Ryan Philippe. I think he's the only one that's really characterized. Yeah. Like he comes off as a brash, not an idiot, but he's Felipe, like a drunk. How, do, how are we saying this? I think I'm saying Felipe. That's how I've always Felipe, heard it. Felipe. Felipe. I don't know what I say. You've been saying Felipe. I can tell you that. Let's look what yeah. Wikipedia would say. Although I never know what to say. Philippe is what. No. Wikipedia says, which I've also heard. Ryan Philippe. That's what. 
yeah. Google just told me. Okay. <sighs> Philippi. My apologies to the to Ryan Philippi, Philippi and the Philippi Ryan family. Philippi. No. But Philippe. Right. Philippe no. <laughs> the problem with the other two, the TV show, is that the showrunners seemed like they were really toxic. Yeah. Great show, but by the way. other two meaning. <laughs> I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was a great show, but it seems like a really toxic work yeah. environment. J Lo Hugh and I even blanked on his name. FPJ. Freddie Prince Jr. Yeah. Mm-hmm. FPJ. Ooh, an FPJ sounds really nice. That would be uh, peanut butter and jelly and frangipan. Oh, okay. A fried, a fried peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That actually does sound nice. You're going to want to go to the Indiana State Fair when it comes in. I'm sure they're working on it. We're working on the technology to fry any food you've ever had. I had one of those. Yeah, ones, they actually. just come off as bland. Yeah. In, the, in an attempt to make them likable, they just come off as bland. Yeah. I think there's a lot of problems with the characterizations of this movie. But I think in its attempt of what it's trying to do, that is... One of its biggest flaws is that they are not given anything to do, nothing to sink their teeth into, so they just come off as very forgettable. Yeah. I can't fault this kind of movie for being like, let's cut this scene where we explain Sarah Michelle Geller's family situation and add in an extra scene where she's chased by a murderer. Because I'm like, this is why people came to this movie. Right. But as someone criticizing the movie, I'm like, I don't understand why I give a shit about any of these characters other than I've seen them on screen for 45 minutes. They've had the most screen time, so I guess I'm invested in them. Yeah. And the inconsistent character stuff, like with Johnny Galecki's character, is he's very only around very briefly. And like you mentioned, he, it's very inconsistent. So you're like, I don't even know what this guy's deal His is. His accent doesn't even seem consistent. Did you notice that? No, I didn't. Like when Ryan Philippi, when Ryan Philippi thinks he's the one sending the letters, he confronts him at Joe's Crab Shack or whatever. <laughs> and Jonathan Galecki's like suddenly like, well, well, well. Like he's got this accent. He's like, well, it, look what the cat dragged in. And I'm like, what are you, where are you from suddenly? What are you, this accent work you're I doing? I was working with my friend Taylor Swift and we were working on some new material, so. We were working down by the docks where we always worked. <laughs> and she says to me, she says, I feel bejeweled. And I was like, I think we got something there. <laughs> All I'm saying is you're my, 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 my lover. I turned to her and I said, you know what never goes out of style? And she's like, don't even tell me yet. I got a fucking great idea for a song. Okay. So while we're talking about performances, I want to talk about Anne Heche because she has. Oh <laughs> the late Anne Heche. The late Anne Heche. Show some goddamn respect. She. See how I turned it and it made you seem like you had disrespected I'm sorry. her even though you said I'm sorry. nothing? Dame the late Anne Heche. <laughs> so <laughs> I think she has the most interesting character but it's also very weird but it's also kind of supposed to be weird so she plays the sister of who they think the victim is who turns out to not be the victim we'll get into the twists and turns of this movie in a second they roll up smg and jlo hugh roll up to this house and it's like oh no smg for me i can't my doctor <laughs> says i couldn't it doesn't possibly. sit right do you have low main that doesn't have an smg on it no it's okay and you it's, put it in the water it's where you baked boil in. it. Okay. Okay. I'll just get some it's made, beef and broccoli. It's made also from the same. seaweed. Okay. Huh. So there's really no reason. <laughs> it's kind of racist that I don't want to have any SMG. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I guess this is back on me. I don't know why my doctor would even mention it. <laughs> so <laughs> you keep it on the table like salt and pepper. SMG. Okay. Hmm. SMG and, and JLO Hugh. Worlds collide. Roll up to this turkey farm, I guess. I know later <laughs> there's upside down turkeys. Being bl- drained of blood. Wouldn't you pluck them before you drain them? I have. I'm no turkey slaughterer. I have no idea how that process okay. works. I don't know. I don't want to know, but I kind of want to know. I want to know a little bit. I feel like the movie's piqued our interest in turkey slaughter. But the first meeting they have with her, she's, I don't know, she's pretty sympathetic. She seems very like weird and she keeps saying, we don't get a lot of visitors around here, which I'm like, yeah, you live in the sticks. That makes sense. To the point where she wants the, I mean, they claim that their car broke down and they just need to use her phone yeah. and she immediately welcomes the, well, she, she seems like standoffish, but also welcoming. I mean, the movie is trying, her characterization yeah. only makes sense in the, the plot of the movie. It doesn't make sense as a person. Right. It makes sense as a movie is being filmed where we want to think that she might be a suspect right. of who's doing all this harassing and murdering. It's like arbitrary. Anytime anyone in, in a movie nature. is questioned by the police where they're like, fuck you. 
Like that's the first thing they say to the police. And they're like, oh, well, this guy, well, this guy I, might obviously. be trouble. Why would you be rude to the police? There's no reason. Just because you're being harassed by them and accused of a crime? <laughs> First off, she looks like a ghost. I mean, Anne Heche is very pale. She's blonde. And then they've dressed her in the finest beiges yeah. of the South Seas. Uh-huh. And so she's just standing there like a Victorian ghost while also talking to – she's doing that less is more acting that Catherine O'Hara describes in, in Waiting for Guffman and <laughs> that she's – talking to Jennifer Love Hewitt while looking at Sarah Michelle Gellar, who is pretending to be on the phone with AAA. It's such a weird scene. Weirder even more the second time you watch it where you know she has done nothing to these girls. And Jennifer Love Hewitt, as the Angela Lansbury of this duo, says, oh, our car broke down. Would you like to tell me about your brother who died? Like, she does the most ham-fisted transitions. <laughs> and Anne Hayes just rolls with it. And she's like, these girls are fun. I like hanging out with them. And I'm going to ask them to come by again because I just love hanging out with girls who want to know about my dead brother who died under mysterious circumstances. Her whole introduction to them is they ring their doorbell. No one's there. And then JLo, he leads them around the outside and she climbs like a log pile to like look in the window. And that's when she sees them. So you can understand, even if she is a bit weird, why she's like, what the fuck are you doing? Right. And then they claim that their, you know, their cars broke down. And obviously it's not. And obviously mm-hmm. it's a fake phone call she's having with AAA. And then their car starts perfectly fine and she gives them their cigarettes in a very confrontational way. But I think Hey! That's how she she addresses them to tell them that you left your cigarettes. You know how when someone leaves something in your house, you go up to them, slam your hand on the window, and go, hey! <laughs> You know, just that, just wait, just to get their attention. In my head, you know, just to let them know. The movie didn't do this, but in my head, Canon, she's fucking with them because they clearly were doing something else (laughs) and the car just immediately starts. So she's like, I'm going to see if I can get a scare out of these. And then the other weird thing, she has two scenes. And when J Lo Hugh returns, I can't remember the reason why. Oh, she brings the yearbook because she wants her to point out this person that she uh, mysteriously talked about while she was reminiscing about her dead brother. Jennifer Love Hewitt brings an old yearbook to see if she can identify him. And then Anne Heche acts like she's never seen Jennifer. She pulls up Freddie Prinze in that, once again, any noun in front of her is brand new to her. (laughs) She approaches her with a knife. It's so stupid. It only works if you're just buying into what this movie is selling, which... Was I? We'll have to wait until the verdict. What a mystery. There's another mystery. So I just want to get into the twist. So the twist is they think they've killed someone. They don't actually kill him. And so they're trying to figure out who is this because somebody is is fucking with them. Maybe the guy is still alive. Who was the guy? But then they found – so the authorities found the body of a guy named David Egan. And Mm -hmm. so that's who they think they killed. And the Missy, Anne Heche is David Egan's brother. So that's why they go to like... Sister. Sister, sorry. So they go to chat with her. At some point, Freddie Prince Jr., this is during the year that we don't see. At some point right, during that... The, the lost the year. Lost year of, I still know what you did last summer. At some point during that year, Freddie Prince Jr. also figures this out, that, hey, this, this is David Egan that we killed. Feels guilty, goes to see her, and says, hey, I was friends with your brother. And then basically befriends her and then they have like it seems like they have a fling or something yeah and then it doesn't that's what Anne Heche implies it doesn't work out so there's that mystery that J-Lo Hugh figures out later Freddie Prince Jr. keeps that a secret just because he doesn't want to upset he wants to get back together because the movie needs him to keep that well and we yeah what it does is also like casts doubt on Freddie Prince Jr. did he do it and you're like what do you mean did he do it what are we talking about (laughs) <laughs> is he in cahoots but, uh, with he's harassing the people that he he covered up a murder what are with? we like i don't even understand what and the movie also, is trying it's just to do for like for a total of two minutes do you think that uh, freddie prince is the the villain yeah like she sees the name of his boat which is the name he gave to Anne Heche. for 90 seconds total you're like maybe he's not the, maybe he's the killer and it's it's all for nothing and this whole like plot branch is just to like distract you for 30 seconds yeah. but that's not even who they killed who they actually killed oh, or right, who they sorry. not killed but who they hit with their car was ben played by muse watson ben willis. ben willis 
Me, yeah, Muse Watson. But yeah, and we find ben out Wells like through a microfiche scene that sometime <laughs> like a couple years ago, <laughs> last uh-huh. last summer. Too many summers in this movie. Can I say that? David Egan, this guy mm-hmm. who is never we only see at the very beginning of the movie. He's the kid on the sort cliff. Of. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. But we yeah, never sorry. like actually are introduced to him other than that. David Egan is dating a girl that we also never meet named Susie. And they're in a car yeah. accident. Lauren had to explain this to me. This is not from the movie. I did not understand. I literally had to stop the movie and turn to Tyler and go, Yes. What? And he he got a, a whiteboard and some photos <laughs> and some red strip. We had to take a break. It was like a breakout session. And then we had to like <laughs> take a buffet break. You know. Why don't we all take lunch yeah. and we're going to break off into groups of three and we're going to go over the preamble <laughs> to I know what you did last summer, which is technically I know what you did two summers ago. <laughs> so David and Susie are dating and they're in a car accident. and. Presumably drunk driving. Yeah, and Susie dies. And she dies. And David is wracked with guilt. He he is. And the town blames. The him town blames him, including Susie's father. Susie's mm-hmm. last name is Willis, and this oh is her father. But I already forgot Ben. Ben Willis. Ben Willis. Yes. So it's so forgettable. At some point, the night that the inciting action of this movie happens, July fourth. July fourth. Ben decides I'm going to I'm going to finally kill David Egan. Sorry, I'm really David having Egan. trouble with these names. And so he oh, yeah. kills they, they leave your brain as soon as they He enter. pushes him off or something. He kills him. We don't know how exactly, right? But he ends up in the ocean. I hit my light. And then walking away from the crime scene or whatever is when Ben is hit by our star vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was already a murderer, so it's fine. This is my other They also th- didn't murder yeah. him. They hit him with a car. And then Well, they did murder they him. They attempted They did try to They murder attempted him. to murder him. They And this is what I hate about I think this is the most disgusting part of the movie is that the movie sort of goes through a lot of like ethical loop de loos to make me feel okay with everything that's happened. I'm like, look, you can't hit someone with your car, then try and hide the body at sea. And then when they later say, oh, you know that body? It was Mussolini. And like, I guess I'm a fucking hero, <laughs> aren't I? No, you're not. You tried to hide a fucking body. So that's the big twist, but it's also very lost on me because I'm like, wait, who? Who? What? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it's, it's, it feels like maybe a plot line that would work a lot better in a movie or in a book, I mean, yeah, because you can it reread seems like it. a lot of, exp- <laughs> you can reread it and these names will sink in because you're also seeing them typed out. But it feels like it's so convoluted that having J-Lo Hugh explain it in this sort of like word salad in the, in the last act of this movie, I'm like, who is Ben Willis? And then they kept saying Susie, like I know who the fuck Susie is. Susie. There's this tattoo that she sees on the body yeah. they initially hit that apparently says Susie, but I could barely read it because it was a really faded yeah. tattoo because it's apparently on her father. It's just so convoluted and ex- it, it expects you to be able to track people you have never seen in the movie yeah. for and keep their names in your head. It's so stupid. <laughs> I mean, I can't speak to the book, but it's obvious that they are really trying to pull a Scream here. Yes. But Scream had killers who I had met in that they were Matthew Lillard and Skeet Ulrich. Cat sound. But they're both, Matthew Lillard? you know, comely lasses okay. in a male way. Matthew Lillard has like a methy vibe, but there's still something there. And the other guy's name is <laughs> Skeet. Well, I don't have to say it. Well, maybe I would. But I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> well... So this was written by the same guy that wrote Scream, but it was actually written... Right, the script Yeah, is. but it was written after, or uh, Scream was actually written Scream after this. Scream is 95? Well, it came out Scream before Scream is 95 this. and this is 97. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Scream came out before this, but it was actually written mm-hmm. after the screenplay was. But he only got this movie made because Scream was successful. And Wait, this isn't his passion project, is it? I, I don't know. He probably wanted more, you know, money. And he's like, hey, I've got this other screenplay that's... I can make like scream if you want. And they were like, yes, please do that. I do appreciate that you told me that the book, that this is based on a book from the seventies, because the other thing that was bothering me throughout this whole movie is that I was like, it felt like it was suffering from that thing that 
a lot of Hollywood movies have that are set in small towns, which is, have you been to a small town recently? They're not just a bunch of crab shacks <laughs> arranged around a dock. They they have streets and thoroughfares and McDonald's. They like they all don't... have Walmarts. They all have them. yeah. They all have. It's 1997. They all have a fucking Walmart and a meth problem. <laughs> that's just beginning. Yeah, but, but don't worry. We're gonna get out of that, and then is... we're gonna go into an opioid problem right after. <laughs> right, right. And this movie is just like. Everyone works at a crab shack or on a crab trawler boat. And it just seems inexplicable to me that I'm like that, that this person has ever been outside of city limits of, of Los Angeles. Yeah. Well, I've never been to this town in South Carolina or in North Carolina. So far be it for me to say, but it sure looks like Pacific Coast Highway where they hit the guy in the first <laughs> place. A lot of palm trees here. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of legacy. So this is obviously playing in the... Scream Legacy. It's like playing in the same sandbox and it's cashing in on the success of that. How many manslaughters do you think this movie inspired? Excuse me? I'm just saying there's... Is this a quiz? There's non-zero amount of people who saw this movie and were like... And went and hit a guy. (laughs) And they were like, if I ever get in a situation with this, that's pretty airtight logic. I don't want to go to jail. One of my favorite lines from the movie was... When J-Lo Hugh goes up to Sarah Michelle Gellar after she gets the first letter, and she's like, someone knows. And Sarah Michelle Gellar says, this is not supposed to be a laugh line, but I laughed audibly. She goes, but we were so careful. And I, I remember I said aloud, you guys were screaming about how you hit a guy with your car as loud as possible on the streets. What are you talking about? <laughs> Ryan Phillippe choked a woman in a dock that was surprisingly well lit and said, we need to take this to our graves. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You were careful. <laughs> I want to talk about the killer in the abstract, not specifically Ben Willis, yeah. but the shape, to borrow the term from Halloween. And Ben Willis is who um, now? <laughs> he's our villain. He's one of the most dastardly villains we've ever yeah. conjured up in the history of cinema. You have Dr. Moriarty, of course, mm-hmm. Judge Doom, and Ben Willis, the crab trawler, who's avenging his daughter's <laughs> death, and then also uh, maybe his own death, but also the high school nemeses of, of the people who... Almost killed him. Little known fact, it was uh, actually supposed to be in Avengers. It was supposed to be Ben Willis instead of Thanos, but they switched it <laughs> last minute. Had to redo all the CG. It was really a whole thing. He was just collecting hooks. It just didn't read the same. We sort of already alluded to this, but his logic of murder makes absolutely no fucking sense. So the first person he kills is Jonathan Galecki, yeah. Bing Bang, and he sticks a hook into his jaw through through his head from the jaw and pulls him over he he was boiling some lobsters because it's north carolina and then drags him across this oven or whatever and that's the goriest yeah. this movie ever gets which i was kind of disappointed by because i mean you and i are scaredy cats but i was like i'm already in i'm already watching the movie so like let's get to it and i'm not really bothered by gore i'm more bothered by you know someone just popping out of nowhere yeah. I'm fine with all the blood you can have coming out of someone's entrails. Sign me up. No, thanks. But then all the other, you kill Jonathan Galecki because he's in the room. And then later he hunts down and harasses Ryan Phillippe. That checks out. But then doesn't kill him. He yeah. he drives his car into Ryan Phillippe, throws him through a barn or a crab shack or whatever, and then stands over him. And that's it. Ryan Phillippe ends up in the hospital, but it's fine. And then later he kills Sarah Michelle Geller's sister for no well, before reason. Before that, he chops her hair. He like comes in to her bedroom right. at night. He chops off her hair. Yeah. He Samson's her. He Deli- He pulls a Delilah, yeah. cuts off her hair, the source of her strength, and then kills a cop for no reason, which Tyler pointed out. He's like, the cop is taking her home. Why do you need to kill the cop? Just follow along. And then go kill her at home. You're just adding a lot of busy work, a lot of red tape <laughs> to your murder spree. It's true. And I guess the, I think the logic of the movie is that he wants it all. He wants to kill these four on July Fourth, right? So he's waiting, and everyone else is just gravy. I guess. Okay. It makes no sense, and also I feel like it works against the half-assed mystery of this movie, which is who is doing all these killings. 
turns out it's a guy you've never seen before or heard of, but you could have kept it going if you hadn't killed Jonathan Galecki and added a few more suspects in there. If you had kept Jonathan Galecki at least for a bit, it would seem at least like compelling. Right. You might have but another you killed option. the main suspect. And then I'm like, well, it's obviously some either some magical monster like Mike Myers or Jason, or it's just going to be some rando. Yeah, there's no one left who could possibly be it. It's right. Sarah Michelle Gellar's dad. You know what I mean? There's like... <laughs> right. He seems like a drunk yeah. and just would want to kill his own daughter. My justification in my head for Jonathan Glecky came from like reading about the movie later where they're like, I think tension wise, they put it in there to have like stakes, right? Like, oh, this guy's actually going to murder them, not just harass mm-hmm. them. But character wise, it was, be- I guess, because he said he was going to call the cops. And if he calls the cops, then potentially either Barry or any of our four could get arrested or put in jail or like be like ungettable for a murder. Mm-hmm. And he wants to do this murder so bad. So he murdered so that he could murder later. But it seems- He really wants to do the murder. It does seem like tying yourself in knots to like justify this. You know, Freddie and Jason or whatever, they've become this sort of like random murder machines. I think the best murders have like some sort of twisted justification in their head. You know what I mean? Like, they're most compelling, not best. Like, I agree with them. Jason started as, in the first Friday the 13th, it was not Jason. It was Jason's mother who was avenging Jason's death because of all those horny teens. And that's fun. (laughs) And Michael Myers is just like this, you know, boogity man. Boogity. But this, I mean, it was. I felt like it was trying to be, it was trying to fit into the Mike Myers mold of just like having him wear an iconic outfit. Unfortunately, the outfit is stupid looking, so it, it's not scary. And it's apparently silly. very popular in Southport. Apparently, everyone's got a fucking slicker. Everyone looks like the Gordon's fisherman, like a goth Gordon's fisherman. Or Paddington. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like the, the flaw of this movie is that there's only four of them. If they had been on like a party bus, we'd have a good number <laughs> of teens we could get through. Yeah. But the fact that there were only four... And not to mention, two of them survive. They don't even fall for the final girl trope. There's a final yeah. heterosexual couple trope. That just means that we're just waiting for some... We have to like bring in a bunch of randos to get killed in order to like up the body count of this movie. Yeah, it's stupid. Um, so it's also kind of like... <laughs> obviously, the movie is playing off of Scream, but the whole one of the compelling factors of Scream is it's playing on the tropes and genres and this is just straight ahead just activating them you know what i mean it's just right. like this is not being clever or meta it's only it. inspired by scream and the fact that it was written by the same guy and like involves teens in the 90s you know what i mean it's like only <laughs> it's right it has nothing to do with any of the things that made scream like sort of interesting yeah it's not even it's not clever like scream was it's I venture to say very blandly shot. I don't think there's any interesting shots in this movie. I never got scared. At, did you get scared at any point in this movie? No. I was and never I am scared. Very easily at scared. Anything. Oh yeah, the closet door is slightly open at some point at night. Did you see me I'm with this door the earlier? Yeah, I was terrified. That's all you needed. Yeah, this was not a scary movie. I mean, I there's. Only one shot I vaguely remember is, which is the Gorton's Fisherman comes in to Sarah Michelle SMG's house. It's kind of at a Dutch angle. I'm like, ooh, someone <laughs> looked up something before they <laughs> took this shot. But otherwise, everything is very like workmanlike and kind of bland looking. One of my favorite things about this movie is that it is very 90s in that every scene is bookmarked with a song from the soundtrack at the beginning of the scene and then at the end of the scene. I'm like, wow, how many artists signed on to be on this soundtrack that you have to jam pack every scene with an obviously like shoehorned in song? It's like the the Blues Brothers are like, ladies and gentlemen, Sugar Ray. (laughs) I just want to (laughs) murder. Sorry, I should have said flay. Damn it. Uh, That would have been good. Yeah. But you really screwed it up. Let's go to the verdict, right? Yeah. I can save my big thing for my verdict. Okay. One more inadvertently funny line before we go. Also from SMG, 
So J Lo Hugh goes to visit her at work, and then they go to visit Ryan Philippi, and then they get online and they're looking up David Egan. They're doing all this stuff, and then at one point, then at the end, a Sarah Michelle Gellar goes, "I've got to get back to work." And I'm like, "What break <laughs> have you been on? You've been all over town. Like you get a three hour murder investigation break as part of your union contract." It is her dad's Where shop. Where have you been going? You know, her sister's probably not going to fire her. So. At one point when Sarah Michelle Gale, Helen is running away from the man, you know, and he's just like walking calmly and <laughs> Lauren mm-hmm. said, we got a classic Pepe Le Pew situation here. <laughs> it's a very common murder, murder movie, horror movie trope where the bad guy just walks and somehow like catches up. Right. Eventually. It catches up to her. We also, this, so the whole premise of this movie is that it takes place on July 4th. The town is virtually abandoned. There is no one on the streets of this town. And I know like the celebration is mostly hang- happening on the beach, but I'm like, do you know there's someone who had to run out and get more beer or yeah. who's like a looky-loo and didn't get to the beach in time? Like there's no one on the streets at all. And then later there's like a parade going down after we've already seen the streets abandoned, there's suddenly a July 4th parade going past SMG's sister's store. They followed it from the beach. Fucking stupid. Let's go to the bird. Come on. Thank you. Damon, what is your bird? You're in a child as an idiot. This movie sucks. This is not a good movie. It is poorly written. It's not very clever. It's not very scary. It's not very gory, which also is something yeah. that the people who like these type of movies are like. The enemy looks like a dope in his fucking slicker. It's not scary at all. I will say this to the movie's credit is that I feel like there are some like interesting premises, like little nuggets of something interesting in this movie that never get really fully developed. I feel like there's an element, we didn't really talk about this, but we see each of the four people before the accident have this really promising like future planned out for themselves. Sarah Michelle Gellar wants to go to New York and become a soap opera actress. Jennifer Love Hewitt wants to go to college. Go to college and become a more staunch feminist, as the 90s would say. And then we're making fun of the movie here. I feel like you and I would both I cling to feminist ideals, we hope. Just want to say we're making fun of the, the 90s attitude towards feminism <laughs> and this movie's <laughs> attitude towards it. Good save. And Freddie Prinze, like he wants to go to college too in New York or, or somewhere. And they all sort of fall apart, except for Ryan Phillippe, who's an asshole. So, of course, he's it's like fine. doing... Doing fine after killing that transient. <laughs> we see Jennifer Love Hewitt. She becomes dour. Slightly paler. <laughs> right, slightly paler. And Sarah Michelle Geller is smoking and she's working in her sister's shop and she's obviously miserable and she's kind of a klutz. Freddie Prinze is working on a, a crab trawler. And there's like something interesting in that and like the promise of like broken dreams and things like that. And then the movie's like, ah! well, the person they ran over was supposed to die anyway. It was terrible. I'm like, that really doesn't explain anything. These people did something reprehensible, no matter who this person was. And the movie wants to sort of forgive them and just sort of make a generic slasher movie. Yeah. And I feel like it could have done something a little bit more interesting. But this movie sucks. So don't run over people with your... If you run over someone with a car, call the authorities, especially when you find out despite your excellent forensic science skills of pulse checking, that they are in fact still alive and can grab women's crowns off their head. Don't just try and hide the body, you fucking freaks. Don't take legal advice from Freddie Prince Jr. He was like, we're all gonna fry, no matter what the cops do or, or something. I was like, you're an idiot. You're a fucking moron. <laughs> anyway, you're in a child's an idiot. This movie is not very good. DJ? Wow. <sighs> There's a lot to unpack there, and it's thank you all things that I agree with. Yeah, you're in a child's an idiot. Two things that I forgot to mention. One, Freddie Prince Jr. ends up on a crabbing or fishing boat or whatever when they come back, and he, J Lo Hughes surprised because she thought he was going to be off in New York or whatever. I, I think it was New York mm-hmm. too. I think I remember him saying, "Okay, it. yeah." And he's like, "Yeah, just like my dad." And then he's like, or something like that. And she's like, "I thought you didn't know your dad." And she's like, "Well, I know that." I was like. 
What is this? What are we doing? <laughs> Why are you establishing this now? It's not necessary. It's too late. What are we talking about? You're supposed to set that up before you make what? Anyway, it was not a big deal, but it was just like it was just this feeble attempt to like add more characterization it's last like second. Someone was like doing their homework while the teacher is like <laughs> collecting it from the class. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> And then... Wait, didn't you get the studio's <laughs> note about more characterization? Oh, fuck! So... Have him say something about his dad! A bigger point that I forgot is... So, they believe that they've killed this man. It was an accident, but they believe that not only did this kill this man, but then they tried to get rid of his body, and then he was still alive. So then they murdered him. That is attempted murder, my that is. I mean, that and is as far as everybody, everybody in this group thinks for a year, they, they murdered someone together. So mm -hmm. they're so racked with guilt by that, that their lives have fallen apart. Jennifer Love Hewitt's character is completely just like falling apart. She can't, she can't focus. She's not good doing well in school. Her bangs are, her all bangs are a weird. mess. Yeah. Her skin looks barely glowing. Her skin is still effervescent, but duller slightly. To quote Tahani Al Jamil, her hair is barely cascading down her shoulders. <laughs> Yet, at the end of this movie, after everyone that they know has been murdered, two of their mm -hmm. four confidants have been murdered, Jennifer Hewitt's doing great. She's thriving. She's thriving and surviving. Hair's looking great, bouncy, full of volume, full of vibrant makeup right before she's getting in the shower. I don't know why. Maybe she's watching it off, weird. but whatever. Maybe she, yeah. It just seems weird that we we're like supposed to like have these consequences, which I think are reasonable that she's racked with guilt and stuff, but she has none of that later. She's not reconciling with the fact that she still did those things, even though it didn't end up that he was dead. And then also her friends were murdered mm -hmm. and some guy that was not. Because of the friend. choices. And because they of the choices yeah. they made. That's fine. That seems weird. Also, after when her and Freddie, I just remember this, her and Freddie are embracing after the, the climax on the, the jib covered boat. <laughs> jib everywhere. She says, we didn't really kill him. All that things, all the stuff we went through for a year was all for nothing. And I'm like, no, no, you still tried to hide a body of someone you hit. I cannot move past that movie. But it turns out he beat his own daughter. That doesn't matter. You still tried to hide a body. There's also that scene on the dock where, where Ryan Phillippe, he's trying to like push the body into the dock. And Jennifer Love Hewitt says, no, it's not too late. And I, my, in my brain, my little lawyer brain went, well, he kind of already moved the body. I mean, it feels like you probably won't. I mean, you're not going to get convicted for murder, yeah. but you're tampering with a crime scene. You're tampering with evidence. You know they know the cops, though, in that town. So, oh, Ryan Phillippe totally knows the cops in that town. Yeah. Oh, one more thing that, that bothered me when he's in the gym and he keeps hearing someone in the locker room and he keeps going, Hello, <laughs> and I'm like, You're in a public gym, <laughs> you see all the other lockers around you, those are for other people. It's probably just some like 75 year old man, fully nude, with his leg up on the bench, fanning his testicles. <laughs> to recap. This movie's trash. <laughs> your child's an idiot. Don't watch this. It's not even, even if you like, if you're not a scaredy cat like me and Damon, like you're not, it's not scary. So like, what's the point? It's not scary. What is the point of this? But it's also not shitty enough to like be yeah. engaging in that mystery science theater way. It's just kind of boring. Only watch this if you just want to see these beautiful people be beautiful. And don't be a perv and do that. Watch something else. But if you want to see Ryan Phillippe be beautiful, watch 54. Don't watch this. Just watch porn. What are you doing? Also a great point. Oh, don't As I said yourself. many times during the Magic Mike era of our, I'm like, hey, straight women, you know porn exists, right? <laughs> what are we doing here? Okay. What do you think, everybody? You're in a child's an idiot at gmail.com. You can text us to leave us a voicemail, 615-576-0525. We didn't do a problematic corner, but I want to thank- This whole movie is- pro The problematic, problematic is, is you murdered a man. I want to thank- And you want me to be <laughs> chill about it. I want to thank Jackson has an unhealthy obsession with Damon for this music anyway. And I want to thank- <laughs> Thank you, Jackson. I want to thank Russ Weaver for the use of his song Top of Two for our ad music. There's no Catherine O'Hara or Sally Field here. Ooh, no. This movie's trash. No. I know, but one? then I don't have Instagram posts. Okay. <laughs> we could either, we could also do a storm. It's not even bad enough to do a, a you know, bad scene award. Yeah, because that's supposed to be for good movies. 
<laughs> a bad scene in a good movie. Is it, is it sexist to give J- Jennifer Love Hewitt just the most attractive award? Maybe we could just give Ryan Philippe. I, can't, I still can't say his name. Philippi and Felipe. Jennifer Love Hewitt, Felipe. the Felipe. like most handsome awards, new awards. Do you have to draw new awards? Maybe these are new awards. The most handsome. Most handsome. And you, it'll let, let you do a bust of Ryan Philippi, which you'll enjoy because it'll be mostly lips. But also that flawless skin. And also a weird horn up here. Mm. He's not perfect. He's, a, he's an actual person. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> he's not perfect. Dot, dot, dot. Perfect. <laughs> We want to thank our patrons for helping us make the show, including Just Cuz. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. I'm back. Lindsay Halleck. Scalphosaurus. Zachary Hartley. Caroline Amberson. <laughs> I saw that. T. Smith. Particle Man. <laughs> Captain Jean-Luc Picard. David Mort. The supreme ruler of this podcast. And the Quilly House of Cats. Jeremy Powlin. Lindsay Nell. Am I supposed to be getting quiet or I'm, James Taylor? I'm saying it like it's a trailer trailer for a Halloween. Like oh, a, Don LaFontaine style. Yeah, spooky movie. His Honor the Mayor. Karen Curd. Beth Zermont. Shit on the cartouche. <laughs> the Hands of Fate. Jonathan Day. Travis Vance. Larissa Maestro. Josh Frigo. Demon's Australian accent. <laughs> Heather Tuggle. The Zesty. Tommy Boy is Damon's favorite movie. Bill Haynes. Dr. Uh, Malcolm's uh, heaving <laughs> bosom. Jackson has an unhealthy obsession with Damon. Mine's turning into just one of those throat boxes. <laughs> the elusive fan, Gromkin, who will enjoy and all those dramatic. Taylor Swift's pro- <laughs> references. We and made. dramatically placed hot dogs <laughs> over here. Thank you all very, very much. If you want to support like them, patreon.com slash your inner child's an idiot. Or will they? Sorry, that was a. I was wanted to end. That's on where, yeah. That's like a fifties. Yeah. Well, that's like an end of a fifties. Yeah, uh, was, movie. wasn't my best reference. Garbage. <laughs>